tonight to very special guests. Um, last time I've seen these guys is more than two decades ago. Uh, they've written a remarkable piece of work, if you ask me, uh, which I was fortunate to read uh, the manuscript a year ago. Uh, remarkable in a sense that it's a very, very comprehensive uh, piece of work. This is it. It's it's heavy. It's it's bulky, and it has lots of information. Yeah, so remarkable in the sense that it's a very comprehensible piece of work. But more importantly, it covers new ground. And in my humble opinion, uh, a way where no one has gone before. That is a uh, some science fiction movie or series also does that. Anyway, um, so. We will record the session. The session is uh, being recorded. Uh, you will get the handouts. There's a lot of information uh, will be passed over to you. You will get the handouts uh, as you see them here with some additional models, etc. So no need to uh, to quickly write. Um, also, we can have a couple of questions during the presentation, but we have more than half an hour allocated for uh, a, a, a good uh, sense making discussion. So uh, don't worry. Um, Alex, Leo, uh, without further ado, <laughs> uh, the floor is yours. Welcome in the Netherlands virtually. OK, bedankt, uh, Peter. Uh, uh, <laughs> good afternoon, uh, collega architect. And that's the end of my Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so and, and, and hi Rob, I see Rob there, uh, uh, a friend from many years. <laughs> okay, so without further ado, uh, 11 years ago, Alex and I published an article in the Journal of Enterprise Architecture on how sustainable enterprise architecture enables business success in times of disruptive change. Uh, Three publications later, we have finally managed to weave a critical mass of our ideas together into a single tome. Uh, and you're looking at the cover. Uh, we are delighted to give you a quick overview of the book. We'll be using some moderately complex slides from the book, but only making a few points on them. Uh, but you'll be able to download the slides so you can review them in more detail uh, if you'd like. And you can ask questions uh, and, and we can come back and, and cover some things that uh, you really want to know right now. Okay, so here's what's going, we're going to cover. So uh, we'll, we'll cover the dilemma, which is in the subtitle of the book, uh, uh, especially focusing on fitness for context, which is a key idea that um, that came to us as we were writing the book. Uh, we'll go through the methodology and its views and some of the key tools. Uh, and we will then talk uh, a bit about the discipline of strategic enterprise architecture, uh, because it, it's somewhat different from what many architects do. And then finally, uh, we'll, we'll get into an example that uh, shows how it can be applied to an emerging uh, uh, disruption right now. Okay, so here's what we're going to cover. Uh, the the yeah you know, we, we're we're going to cover the challenge, okay, uh, the dilemma and the solution. We're going to start with the premise that that today's times are you know that that what really characterizes them that's different from uh, other times when I was doing architecture is, is that disruptive change uh, is pervasive and unrelenting. Uh, and, <coughs> excuse me, uh, given that premise, we believe that remaining fit for the changing context is critical for surviving and thriving. Uh, and to remain fit, an enterprise might even have to adjust uh, its purpose. Uh, so then we'll focus on the fitness and the balance between these, these two aspects of it. Uh, uh, and then, then uh, we'll get into the, 
solution. Uh, we'll cover the views and methodology first and then the, the discipline. So, uh, first a little bit more about the dilemma. Uh, we believe strategic enterprise, enterprise architects uh, should be working in mostly in the upper right quadrant of this two by two matrix. Where we're contrasting fitness for purpose and context versus today and tomorrow uh, to understand. And they should be there in that upper right quadrant to understand and plan for what may be coming. And also spend a significant amount of time in the lower left quadrant to make sure that the enterprise's systems are built with the flexibility to make rapid adaptation um, by having the you know that flexibility and they're already built in so that it's more reconfiguring and turning knobs. Uh, there are lots of challenges to balance these needs. And so uh, we, we've sort of focused on, on these five. Uh, you know, complexity is obviously a challenge, and we'll talk more about it later. Uh, uncertainty and unfamiliarity always accompany disruptions. Uh, and, and so we uh, are gonna have to make guesses with lots of unknowns uh, about what to do. And uh, it's been my experience that frequently when there is a large change, there's uh, usually a fair amount of resistance to it. And if it comes from a powerful stakeholder, um, th you know, that can, can take some time. So for example, has management even accepted the idea of strategic enterprise architecture? And should the existing enterprise architect team doing, uh, do it? Um, so let's look at a few of the basic concepts and relationships uh, for, uh, you know, for <coughs> uh, having fitness. So the, yeah, it's about enterprise architecture. So let's start with the enterprise. Uh, the enterprise exists within a strategic context that is subject to many potential disruptions. The enterprise has value that it provides in a unique and attractive capability, uh, along with its vision, that must adapt to these disruptions. How well it adapts determines its fitness for the context. Uh, however, the future is uncertain, so the strategy should ideally invest in flexible systems that can handle plausible futures represented by scenarios. And it's always about the stakeholders. They're the key actors, uh, the strategic stakeholders, uh, and they, they assess the fitness and adapt the strategy to enhance the capabilities fitness as the context changes. So let's talk more about fitness. So, Many people hear fitness and immediately think fitness for a purpose because that's that's what it has come to mean by and large. Uh, also, you know, fitness for the changing context, uh, for the current context, is sort of implicit, and so everybody is is kind of automatically going to do that. The third is is where we we tend to believe a lot of the focus has to go when we're in a disruption. So we have to anticipate what's going on, uh, what are the trends and, and what could occur. Uh, and and uh, finally, the, the fitness for you know, the local ecosystem, uh, greater ecosystems, and, and this is a maximizing carrying capacity. Um, and, and this is clearly important um, and different uh, enterprises come to it at different times. Okay, the strategic focus means we have to think a little differently about the architect's job. So what we are showing here is a, uh, a spectrum of disruption and stability. Uh, and contexts that are on the left, so they're subject to frequent and and disruptive changes and on the right contexts that are relatively stable. Common enterprise architecture practice typically assumes a relatively stable context on the right where the job is to close the gap between the 
current capability and the desired future capability. Strategic enterprise architecture practice, however, must assume that the context is relatively unstable, so we're on the left, uh, and the, that simple gap analysis is inadequate. So rather the job is to ensure that the potential future capability is fit to cover all of the plausible future conditions. Uh, so a strategic enterprise architect has to approach other things differently too. So Alex, I think you are going to. Uh, yes, uh, we put this diagram on the cover of the book because it highlights two of the three main components of solution to the dilemma, the methodology and the views. We'll explain this slide in detail later, but right now we are focusing on potentially disruptive change. And we know that the adaptive enterprise cycle starts with recognizing uh, this change and sensing and interpreting uh, about that. So um, we use scenarios and associated strategic signals to recognize disruptive shifts. Um, strategic planning starts with creating a consensus interpretation of the current reality. So how do we get there? Well, there are facts, things that are currently true, but there are also aspects of those facts, meta information, about whether it's actually true, false, or objective, subjective, or whatever else. And the strategic and the stakeholders' perspectives are going to differ. Each stakeholder may have strategic stakeholder may have a predisposition for interpreting those facts. And so we have three, we may have n different interpretations depending on how many stakeholders there are. They still must reach some kind of a consensus interpretation. That doesn't mean that they're thinking there will be a single future, but that they're, they agree on what futures are plausible. Well, how do they, they represent the plausible futures? We do it with the scenarios. Each scenario represents a different uh, plausible future and a different uh, different kinds of uncertainty as to where the future may go. You have to get to those features. You've got to actually make sure that there is a plausible path to each of these scenarios. Sometimes there's a branch point in them. And you have to have path points to be able to measure progress to those um, uh, to those scenarios. Uh, we also introduced the concept of a strategic signal, which enterprises should be always watching for because the strategic signal may say that the path point or that a future path is just not valid. You can't get there because of this disruptive change. And th so they have to be able to uh, scramble and change their scenario structures or what whatever is necessary. Uh, using scenarios in this way is non-trivial but it is at the heart of what we call scenario-driven strategic enterprise architecture. So now let's look at the fit. Uh, we have a simple diagram here uh, that illustrates the key point that stakeholders must understand the enterprise and its core value, you know, represented by the capability that it has, and they must understand the true strategic context, how it's changing, what features are plausible like we just talked about. Only then can the stakeholders gauge strategic fitness. So, well, let's explore this. So we have the diagram here, but the book provides checklists for both methodology activities and views, and we'll start using them here. They ask essential questions that are often overlooked, and so we call them prototypical because they need to be tested and adapted to any particular enterprise. So, for example, some checklists for enterprise essentials. Is there a level of understanding good enough? Are there gaps? And we have to look at the strategic context. Are we considering the re relevant context or are we overlooking things? We go through a series of questions there and they can be modified. <laughs> the all evaluating fitness must be realistic and pragmatic. Uh, plausible features, workable evaluation process, things have to be what we often call to good enough. And this has to be an active process. We need to be continually improving our understanding. Even if we think the enterprise essentials are pretty stable, we still have to be looking into the things we have to be preparing for because the context is not stable. And is our progress good enough for what's really happening in the context? 
And so our path forward needs to be realistic. We must allocate resources and start initiatives and the strategic stakeholders must agree on what the, what the definition of success means. So we next consider the context in detail, specifically the strategic factors that the enterprise must consider. So we like the extended version of PEST, PEST, which uh, is an uh, acronym for political, economic, societal, and technological. Uh, PEST alert adds in three more categories, legal, environmental, and resources. Um, they're often overlooked if you are using PEST, and it could cause uh, a, a, a challenge to the viability of the enterprise. For example, let's say there's a change in regulations. If not accommodated by the enterprise capability, this could result in delays and even orders to cease activity. Uh, similarly, inadequate resources could stop the production lines, as with the chip problem in automobiles recently, where the assembly lines actually stopped. They could not build cars because they didn't have the chip. Each Pessler category can have a different scope in its impact. And so it's always helpful to visualize a scope version of it, and the scope originates from the fact that we have the core enterprise, typically an extended enterprise, and in an enterprise ecosystem, and of course, the contextual environment as well. We'll visit this again in our generative AI example, which started in the technology sector, but quickly spread to all of the other sectors. Fitness for the strategic context is important. The next slide illustrates key dimensions that determine capability fitness for the strategic context. Um, when we look for a way to unpack and tease apart capability fitness, we also look for a mnemonic that captured the major dimensions that were always a part of fitness. So we came up with uh, this fuser, fuser's qualities to be useful be, and we found them useful because they address key areas that uh, enterprises must worry about. So function is the essence of the capability. Uh, we use both user and stakeholder because it's not just limited to the end user, of course. Uh, safety and security is about not doing harm. Economy, it's always about the money. And then responsiveness is, does, does it show up when it's needed? And sustainability, does it last? So, and these are, the mnemonic covers a broad range, but we have all the normal illities that people worry about. And it turns out that some of the illities fit more than one category. For instance, if you change, uh, if you choose reliability, business continuity, and avail uh, continuity and availability, certainly uh, they're in the safety and security uh, area, but they're also in response to this users, stakeholder experience, and so forth. So. We like to visualize how good the fit is. Um, and this is a model that captures some key points um, about, it, it, it sort of derives from weather forecasting. So weather forecasting uses different colors to talk about how severe the storm is. And um, we, so we borrowed this approach and the red is obviously where things we are worried about yellow we are cautious and so forth as the key shows here uh, on this diagram security and infrastructure are both red and are a major concern for enterprise in our example we'll be covering generative ai in which both of these areas would be a major concern um, the legacy any legacy systems uh, might be insufficient, have insufficient modularization to be adapted to, uh, to the benefits of generative AI. And we know about security issues with, with AI, and so uh, that's what happens. Uh, the next slide shows a model that captures some key points from systems theory that need to be understood to address common issues and obstacles, and Leo will be talking about that. Okay, thanks, Alex. So, uh, systems thinking ends up being one of the ways that we get to uh, understand complex situations. So, uh, this iceberg model uh, we have found to be a very good way. So, the events that's, you know, 
are we on a particular path, for example, patterns, uh, they are, what are we seeing in the events? They're, they're a little harder to pick up. So that's, we've got this notion of a, uh, of a water line uh, and there's a lot more going on down below. Um, structures are sort of the heart of systems thinking. That's what causes things to happen. And they can be you know, non-obvious things. They can be delays. They can be um, uh, some type of, of, of command signals. Uh, it can, but there can also be feedback like, uh, like disincentives. Uh, if, if somebody gets too powerful, somebody else tries to take them down a notch. And so all, all of this is, is what ends up being called structures, but, but it's really about causal structures. And one thing that Alex and I have figured out a lot uh, or spent a lot of time figuring out is uh, mental models, because especially with disruptive times, the models that people used to think and understand thing and take action uh, in the world, they, they change. And, and so getting those inserted into the, the minds of the people who need to, to have them uh, and, and adjust them, that's a crucial activity. And worldview is just the deepest models that uh, the an important thing is, is this helps us find uh, ways to intervene, to, to make a change. Uh, and as it turns out, the deeper you go in this iceberg uh, and make a change at that level, the more impact that change has. But it's also harder to make. Uh, often people, for example, don't like to share their worldviews. Okay, so uh, next we'll uh, look at a decision-making tool where we've embedded some of the, uh, the uh, system thinking. So this is a tool uh, known as the, um, started out with Knafen uh, model of, of structured decision-making under situations of complexity. Uh, and, and so the, the titles themselves uh, for these different four quadrants, simple, you know, complicated, these things can be readily architected. Uh, as things get more complex, uh, yes, you can do some architectures, but, but, but really they're gonna be temporary architectures. You have to try things. It's, it's, it's about experimentation. And, and if you get down this lower left quadrant, uh, it's, it's, um, it's all hands on deck, let's figure out what's going on. And we've got a question mark in the middle here, and, and this is uh, where things come in uh, and, and uh, have to be assigned either in whole or partitioned and put the parts in, in different quadrants. So maybe there's only one part that needs some um, experimentation, for example. Um, but the, what we did is we added the uh, system thinking uh, layers to help understand what's going on in each of these quadrants. Okay, so we've presented seven tools and methods uh, as, and they're summarized here. Actually, that's not quite true. We, we've talked a bit about six of them. We haven't yet talked about hierarchical concept maps, but that's going to be coming up in a few slides. So these, we think, are inherently useful tools that we we need to work with disruptive change. Okay, so let's see, strategic enterprise architecture views. So let's focus on, uh, on some of these views. This first, so we're coming back to this, this slide here uh, that we looked at. Uh, to see where the, the views come from. They're gonna be aligned with these key concepts. Uh, so, so the first two columns show the relationships between those basic concepts on that diagram uh, and the six core strategic enterprise architecture views. So Alex has already shown you the first two views when discussing the fit between the enterprise essentials and the strategic context as the essence of strategy development, the simple flow chart with the checklist. Uh, we represent the views as stores uh, on, on our next diagram. We'll come back to all of these. Okay. 
So, so far we've discussed mostly, uh, mostly on the, we focus mostly on the strategic fitness view. Uh, and we've, we've looked a bit at the enterprise essentials and strategic context. Now we'll take a quick look at two of the models used in the capability architecture view. So clearly the capability architecture view must deal with not only the enterprise itself, uh, but also the key parties it interacts with in the enterprise's ecosystem. Uh, so for example, there are influencers, there are markets, the regulators as Alex mentioned. So let's look at more detailed model of the generic enterprise with its several contexts. So uh, a lot of our architecting over the years has focused on the enterprise's internal value chain. Uh, it's a good place to start. And many systems had to focus there. Uh, today, clearly the true value uh, of the true value chain involves not only the enterprise and the extended enterprise, but also the large parts, if not the entire enterprise ecosystem. So all of this exists in, in the context, uh, both internal and internal, uh, and the context can change. Uh, so when change happens, many parties, maybe even all have to adapt. So you know, they, what, what part of this change impacts me and what do I have to do about it? So critical question that everyone has to ask is what resources are going to be impacted by the change? So this is, we call it the capability and resource viability model was inspired by uh, a British uh, economist, uh, Kate Rayworth. And she came up with a, a model called the donut of social and planetary boundaries. Um, and she used it for sustainable cities, uh, which has been adopted by Amsterdam uh, amongst others. Uh, we generalize it to work for enterprises, uh, the model helps strategic stakeholders visualize the viable cap capability sweet spot across many resource categories. And the sweet spot represents a range in which the availability and use of resources is good enough. It's always about getting to good enough. Uh, we'll use this model in the generative AI example later. So now Alex will give you a closer look at the methodology. Uh, thank you, Leo. Um, this is the adaptive enterprise cycle. And with all the parts that we saw before, let's look at how it works. Um, Colonel John Boyd of the United States Air Force described what he called the OODA loop, the observe, orient, decide, and act loop. And we borrowed, he, he, was, a, he was a fighter pilot. And so when he was in combat doing a, uh, what fighter, fighter pilots do, uh, he realized that you have to observe where you are, what's happening around you and where your orientation is and immediately decide what to do and act in a very rapid succession. Um, we found this approach to be very relevant to enterprise for enterprises dealing with disruptive change, but we changed the OODA to recognize, decide, and act. And we added the improve phase, and we'll talk about why we have done that. Um, recognize actually in, is supposed to include observe and oriented, uh, orient, and we call this sense and interpret, and we'll see this on the next slide. So recognize covers sense and interpret, decide is pretty much what Decide meant there, but we broke act, uh, act into two categories, act develop and act use. Now, when you're in a uh, fighter plane, you don't have to develop and use, you just uh, act <laughs> as fast as you can. Um, and so um, we have the improved phase is because we have a changing context that we have that may not be, you may not be able to act and use it the way you expected to. And so you throw up your hands and you say, we can't control this anymore. What do we have to do to improve it? And the improve phase is to say, maybe we have to go back and change some of the development and then it'll work. Or maybe it, it shows that we did, 
didn't truly really understand what was going on. And we have to do a quick cycle again uh, to to figure out, to understand and recognize what the new changes are. Uh, the cycle consider, considers architecting to be continuous and adaptive. And these phases are described in more detail on the next slide. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on this. We included it because it's uh, it's in the book and it might be helpful to you in the in the slide deck that you'll receive. So this slide is a hierarchical concept map that illustrates the relationships between the views and methodology. Um, the cycle uses the views and creates and updates their uh, their content and the strategic uh, enterprise architecture views form the basis uh, for a number of in context hierarchical concept maps. Uh, Leo will be describing one in a minute. Uh, the book also has many out of context maps which dive into the details so you can understand where these maps come from. So let's look at a uh, the summary context, a concept map. It's a little complicated and Leo will be stepping you through each of the uh, steps. Okay, thanks, Alex. So the boxes in blue are the fundamental concepts. We've seen those already. Uh, building out the columns. So we start with the enterprise essentials. The strategy addresses key factors in the strategic context and drives the overall capability. The metrics, for example, infusers, uh, excuse me, the, the capability in turn uh, is provided by many component capability systems and other parties in the enterprise ecosystem. And they have system quality metrics, uh, for example, the fusers that Alex mentioned. Um, the strategic context describes the conditions that the enterprise must plan for, in particular, those that are selected by scenarios. And each scenario has a primary driver, the thing that is causing the scenario to be considered at all. Uh, scenarios help us avoid boiling the ocean of, of conditions. Uh, strategic stakeholders are the key players. They create, monitor, interpret, and adapt all of the content in the views. They sense and interpret the strategic context. They have considerations that identify and prioritize the conditions that they want addressed. Uh, capability architecture focuses on descriptions of updates to the capabilities and systems, and at least models the ecosystem, uh, may not uh, get a chance to, to uh, design that ecosystem, may make it a chance to influence some parts of it, you know, for example, with standards. In the strategic fitness view, the fitness gets assessed by the strategic stakeholders. To do this, they make comparisons between the strategic factors, Pessler, uh, within the strategic context and the system qualities of the capabilities. The comparisons identify misfits. Uh, and this is a key thing. These misfits are things that must be tar targeted by the architecture updates. It turns out these misfits also end up driving the enterprise essentials, including strategy, the capability architecture and updates, and, and to some extent, even the strategic stakeholders. So they, they see the misfit and, and causes them to, to take action. Uh, finally, you need initiatives to actually make changes. The strategic initiatives view organizes, prioritizes, and, tr and tracks the initiatives. The misfits themselves drive those initiatives, which should reduce the misfits and improve the overall capability systems and their system qualities. So these are the main concepts discussed in the book. Uh, that's it for the views and methodology. Let's take a quick look at the discipline. So, so what precisely is strategic enterprise architecture? Um, the bottom line is, is probably the most important thing to get here. The key responsibility of the strategic enterprise architect is to ensure the enterprise's capabilities and systems are fit for all plausible current and future contexts. Okay, that's it. The three columns we, we uh, 
were inspired by a McKinsey report rethinking the role of the strategist and it used these three uh, things, uh, generating insights, uh, in, uh, enacting and enabling strategic decisions and owning specific value layers. And so we think for strategic enterprise architects, the key activities are making everyone aware of the need for fitness for context, uh, making sure that the strategy is realized in the built systems, and three, working with key stakeholders to define the architectures of the strategic initiatives. So when do, do the strategic enterprise architects do this? So the strategic enterprise architecture group focuses on keeping the systems fit for the emerging context. They can do this reactively, and that's good. They can use short-term trend product projections. Uh, that's usually better. And longer term scenarios often best but hardest to do, especially when you're looking at trends and things that might happen. Uh, it must work closely with the enterprises strategy group. Uh, this is not a separate operation by any stretch of imagination. So what have we covered so far? Okay, so we covered the dilemma, uh, what fitness for context means, the adaptive enterprise cycle methodology and views very briefly along with key tools, uh, and the discipline of strategic enterprise architecture. So uh, time for a current disruptive change example to illustrate how the methodology works. Uh, over to you, Alex. Okay, thank you, Leo. Um, we're going to quickly go over a number of aspects of generative AI as a disruption and apply our approach to uh, various aspects of it. Um, we'll cover why it's a good example, what are the opportunities, risks, use cases, uncertainties and scenarios, principles, questions, and what do we do now and in the future? And one of the things you'll find uh, probably pretty interesting is that we're going to be asking uh, GPT for some of the answers. You'll be surprised at how good some of those answers are. Um, interest in AI has just exploded recently. Uh, it's about an eightfold increase uh, since the end of 2021. Why is this happening? Uh, the, set, the technology has been steadily improving for years. So why now? Uh, and, the reason is that generative AI has made a quantum leap in performance, ease of use, and utility. And the news has, has sort of broadcast that as well. Uh, we gave you give you here some of the interesting quotes. Uh, uh, I like this one. Uh, this one had, was a relatively scary article in the New York Times. And this one was also not somewhat scary from a uh, Scientific American. Um, how does it know to do things that no one told it to do? So what is generative AI? Uh, most people have used chat GPT for conversations and have been surprised at how useful the results can be. Uh, generative AI is not just text aggregated from worldwide web content as people might have expected. It improves based on user feedback, and it's called Reinforcement Learning from Human Feedback, or RLHF. Even researchers, the big thing is that even researchers don't really understand some of its capabilities. Language models are inherently not transparent and may not become transparent because there's a gold rush on. There's a lot of competition, and an incentive is perhaps not to share the IP that you'd like because they, they might, may amount to trade secrets, but it's moving fast. People have to get on board. Um, serious concerns by the experts because it's moving so fast. So let's take a look at a snippet of a uh, conversation between a college dean and of engineering and chat GPT-4. Um, do you have anything to add here, Leo, before you go to that? Yeah, I, I did want to add one uh, one thing, uh, and, and that it's, um, so one of the things that has emerged um, was, turns out 
nobody was hoping or even imagining that uh, ChatGPT could write code, but it turns out it can write code. So that was a surprise, but even more surprising because it turns out it can execute code. Um, you, if you give it uh, an algorithm for, for um, how to compute numbers in the Fibonacci series, it turns out you can answer the question, what's the 81st, uh, 81st element of that uh, series? Uh, it turns out if, if you don't give it the code to do that, the algorithm to do that, it can't answer the question. But if you provide the algorithm, it can. And, and that's kind of staggering because uh, it doesn't have short-term memory other than the short-term memory for the conversations that it's holding. So it clearly has repurposed that conversation memory and is using it to execute code, which is kind of mind boggling that it can do that. <laughs> okay, so, so this, this is a conversation that, uh, that has been written up by uh, the Microsoft uh, AI, uh, so, so it's, it's got a program of uh, responsible AI, uh, and uh, it's publishing right now uh, a series of articles by people not working for Microsoft who have had early access to ChatGPT, uh, and uh, they've already published eight articles uh, in this anthology series, and they're publishing four more a week every Monday for the next three weeks. So there'll be 20 in total. And I found some of them to be quite good so far. And this is just a snippet out of, out of one of them. So uh, the first part is the, from the perspective of a dean of engineering. So the person asking uh, this, Alex Gallimore is in fact a dean, but he doesn't tell chat GPT that that's the case. And a science fiction enthusiast who, who read 2001 A Space Odyssey many times, how will the role of engineers in society evolve as the, they create technology alongside powerful AI agents? And so chat GPT instantly comes back. Parallels between Hal's journey and the space odyssey and our own path serve as both a cautionary tale and a source of inspiration. Technology will continue to advance. And it's our duty to ensure that it augments human values rather than working against them. The key lies in striking a balance between embracing the potential of AI and safeguarding the well-being of humanity. Well, that's that's a rather uh, impressive to me. I, I, I've worked on some early AI systems and, and, and didn't even get close to anything like that. Okay, next slide, please, Alex. Uh, okay, so we're going to quickly go through key benefits and some other aspects that Alex mentioned. So some of the key benefits are opportunity uh, to improve the quality of search for and generation of useful information. And that's, that's what Alex and I have been using a lot. Um, lower cost of customer support uh, and automate uh, you know, some parts of information work. Uh, greatly improve the quality of human understanding, uh, and of course, make money. Those are those are things that uh, we're doing. So, what about risks? Um, well, uh, there's been a lot written ab about the risks of generative AI. Some of it, perhaps, a bit over the top. Um, maybe not. Uh, we'll see. But we like to think of the risks in in three broad categories misuse by normal users. So HR discrimination is one that has, has come up a lot. Uh, uh, malicious use by bad actors. Um, that one's probably one of the most worrisome uh, uh, and unintended side of, uh, effects. White collar job displacement clearly and, and others. Uh, let's look at some of the use cases. Uh, so again, we we asked ChatGPT to tell us what it thought were key normal and key misuse cases, and these are its answers. And I look at these lists and I say, 
yeah, these sound sound pretty good. Uh, they don't have all the things that I might have added to the list, uh, but there's a good argument for for each of these. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. The the next slide uh, came out of a different question. So having been given that list of of um, uh, of excuse me, uh, of, of key uh, use cases. Uh, what are some of the key uncertainties about how generative AI might evolve? Uh, and it gave us another list of seven. Um, and I'll just talk about three of these. So the upper left, ethical and social impact, malicious use, AI generated misinformation, invasions of privacy. So all of these are its words. We've extracted in the sub bullets, uh, key, key phrases from paragraphs, but, but this is everything, nothing that, that we added. Uh, let's drop down to the fourth one because this is where we use, uh, use ChatGPT a lot. Uh, AI so one of the uncertainties is AI models may lack deep enough understanding of concepts, context, and meaning to generalize and adapt to novel situations. So that's really important for what we're talking about, disruptive change. Uh, and then drop down to the seventh one, um, environmental impact. AI models can be computationally intensive. Um, creating a, a new language model takes uh, about uh, uh, five lifetimes of, uh, create, of the energy creating and driving a car, for example, five cars over their lifetime, uh, re requiring significant energy consumption and computing resources. Okay, let's, let's uh, look at scenarios for each of these uncertainties. So uh, my request was, give me a positive, a generally positive and generally negative scenario for each uncertainty that you've listed. And so this is just the short list. Let's, again, just look at the three that we did. So for the ethical and societal impact, positive, robust regulation and ethical standards. Okay, um, it doesn't work out well, malicious misuse and deepening divide. Okay, dropping down to generalization misunderstanding. So the positive uh, uh, scenario is improved generalization and contextual understanding, negative scenario, unreliable generalization and misinterpretation. And the environmental one, sustainable, practices and energy efficiency and the negative increasing environmental footprint. And so I'm gonna go through quickly just, just one of these. Um, again, you can read the others. Um, the ethical and societal impacts, positive scenario, robust regulation. And just look at this in the scenario, in this scenario, there's a generally positive resolution to the ethical and societal impact of generative AI. Governments, organizations, and researchers work together to establish robust regulations and ethical standards for the development and deployment of generative AI technologies. Transparent and accountable practices become the norm, ensuring that AI-generated content is used responsibly and potential harms are minimized. Public trust in generative AI grows and society benefits from the creative and productive applications of the technology. I mean, this, this to me is a pretty good summary of what's going on here. So, uh, so I, I hope this interests you in, in looking at uh, this a little bit more, more uh, closely. So uh, next, we look at, uh, Let's see, <laughs> excuse me, uh, a, a key driver and a uh, key goal, self-interest, uh, don't get left behind. And that operates both for architects and enterprises. So uh, our general belief is that generative AI has a potential to be a game changer and must be taken seriously by, by architects and enterprises. That's not enough um, to know where you, it's not enough to know you need to gain this, you need principles to help you focus on how to proceed in an enterprise. And so um, 
I learned a long time ago that principles are crucial. It's not just models in enterprise architecting. And so uh, uh, decided to try my hand at crafting a few here. And strong AI governance is, is uh, a, a critical one. Uh, and yeah, you need a strong leader basically who drives appropriate use of AI within the enterprise. And that leader involves all key stakeholders. Um, the others here, what could possibly go wrong? You need continuous monitoring, misuse, abuse, unintended consequences, and sort of uh, adopting a first do no harm. Uh, it'd be nice if, if uh, all parties, all enterprises, including governments, were to uh, look at it this way. I'm not sure we're going to get that, however. OK, Microsoft has come up with some of their own very simple, typical uh, enterprise architecture uh, AI principles, generative AI principles. So many of these are common, reliability, safety, privacy, security. We see those all the time. But, but fairness, inclusivity, transparency, accountability. Transparency is a, a critical one because it, it really is important that we understand these. And uh, I, I think while it's important, it's not currently as robust as it needs to be, in our opinion. Um, uh, maybe standards will help. Uh, uh, so, excuse me, the, the, the uh, enterprise, adaptive enterprise cycle uh, provides a good basis for analyzing key activities and highlighting questions about generative AI at each phase. So Alex, your turn. Okay, yeah. Uh, as we said, it is a good basis. We have shown you some of the checklists. In this case, these are the beginning questions that might eventually uh, be uh, be the checklist that we talk about. Uh, in in the uh, examples we use in the book, for instance, we'll often talk about what is disruption. Uh, if we don't really understand the disruption, we do pretty much. We've gone over a lot of the change here, so we just sort of name them in situations where we don't uh, know what they are. Then it's questions. Do we really understand what the change is? Um, so considering that this, the side phase, um, we ask questions that really need to be asked. For example, um, do our key stakeholders have the needed generative AI expertise? Uh, and are they all engaged? Clearly, if they're not, this is one of the things that the enterprise needs to address. And so that would be perhaps uh, one of many items in a checklist. Um, mm -hmm. Certainly, we'll, we'll be concerned about what initiatives must change. Um, and here is the. Uh, strategic factors diagram that we had before. Uh, we've introduced um, asterisks to stars for the main areas to consider for a particular context. So not, a, not all the areas are impacted, uh, and so we're trying to trace cascading. And so the stars would be used to, to indicate, for instance, something in our particular case, we're starting with a technological uh, change. And so, um, what would be uh, vulnerable to generative AI risks? Uh, and one of the things that is really important for any particular um, enterprise is the enterprise ecosystem. So we could be, we as an enterprise could be completely ready uh, to adopt generative AI and ready to run. And then we find out that the ecosystem just hasn't, hasn't gotten there. And so, is, it becomes a uh, something that we need to really uh, work on influencing. So uh, we also need to consider the system qualities uh, needed to support plausible generative AI scenarios. So going back to our system qualities, uh, you can read the, through uh, a number of these questions on your own, but let's just uh, focus on one of them, sustainability. Um, we know that sustainability is about surviving and thriving. We mentioned that a number of times in the book, but the thing that's really critical for sustainability is, do we have a continuous process for recognizing strategic signals that detect emerging generative AI capabilities and then going ahead and adapting? This is part of the uh, continuous iterative and adaptive nature of what we think should happen. 
Uh, but an enterprise can only prepare for the plausible future scenarios if it has the resources to do so. Um, so we consider the resource slide that we've shown before. Um, and our version of the Rayworth Donut um, unpacks the R from the Pessler category into a number of categories as we've already discussed. But let's look at one of these, uh, reputation. Uh, that's something that's a resource that may not have been considered uh, as, as, as much. Um, but it needs to be addressed when rushing into implementing a strategy, uh, architecture and plans for the future. Um, the um, You probably are familiar with voicemail jail. You call up for support and you only get these bots that don't seem to have really good answers. But as the answers get a lot better, uh, an enterprise might have a support group and you might call it generative AI jail. Um, that may be good or it may be bad. If the generative AI answers are incomplete, you're going to want to talk to a human and that may not allow you to. But it may turn out after a while when generative AI gets better and better that you don't want to talk to a human that doesn't seem to understand your problem. And generative AI might actually be able to focus on it. So this, this is the kind of thing that needs to be considered. Uh, so what are the actions that enterprises need to consider for generative AI? Uh, many people, many enterprises have, um, have, uh, have at least explored a little bit of generative AI, and some are deeply into it, obviously, the ones that are competing. But for an enterprise that's new to it, they need to become familiar with generative AI. Uh, they not need to follow the news. They need to talk to uh, stakeholders who know about it. And then they need to use it. Just explore it on any topic you'd like to explore it on. My One of my, uh, well, we, we did, uh, we explored several different topics. Uh, one of the topics I decided to explore was uh, um, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill in uh, the Gulf of Mexico and found out all sorts of things about what was incomplete and how you could get generative AI to get a much more complete picture. Um, you need to adopt principles for responsible use of AI. Uh, it's a good idea to have a leader who uh, understands what's going on, what the risks are, what what should happen, and to make sure that things don't go wrong. Uh, but once you've done that, you look for a limited uh, risk, low risk uh, use of generative AI and see how well it works. Try it out. And if it does seem to work, then expand it and analyze it, assess it, and um, broaden uh, the development as necessary. Uh, one yeah. of the things that I don't think I mentioned that's at the center of our uh, our uh, adaptive enterprise cycle is uh, integrated governance and learning. It's very important to be recording what you know, what you didn't know, why you chose a particular thing, and what would cause you to change your mind, uh, especially if a scenario needs to change. And so that's a core part of understanding how to move ahead on it. And of course, we repeat, we go through, and once we know something about this, we get more and more familiar and use it anymore, use it some more. Uh, this concludes our presentation, but we are happy to take questions. Uh, Peter? Okay, good. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, well, um, impressive. Uh, so, please question. Please go ahead. Open your microphone, unmute, and let's discuss. So everyone well, is... actually, uh, it's quite impressive, and uh, I think I have to rewatch this uh, recording to comprehend uh, the the whole model. So uh, <laughs> thank you. Yes, thanks. Any more? Okay. Well, I have questions. <laughs> I'm sure you do. <laughs> um, well, first of all, okay, I I have the book, so 
I've read a lot of stuff before, and uh, like uh, like Bonnie said, it's uh, it's impressive. We I'm glad we recorded because a lot of information has been handed over. Um, the one thing that I try to position um, is you read a lot and we experience a lot in the field about um, agility, uh, agile enterprise architecture, agile enterprises, uh, continuous architecture. Uh, how, how does agile, uh, lean and all those processes relate to, can, can you position that in, within your approach? So, want me to take that one, Alex? I'm happy sure, to. you can take that. Yeah, okay. So, so our focus, Peter, is on adaptive architecting. And adaptive architecting starts with the right capabilities and adapting them constantly to emerging needs. And it also entails building enough flexibility uh, into the, uh, excuse me, <coughs> to, to, to adapt readily to the plausible uh, future conditions uh, as defined by the scenarios. So if, if Agile really is being used to mean a series of rapid approximations to a desired capability. No, that's that's not really our approach. But if Agile means careful consideration of the changing context and building in the flexibility to adapt rapidly um, to plausible future scenarios, then yes, we 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 embrace that sense of Agile. Mm -hmm. So it is more in the execution of the architecture as part of the whole framework. Because yes, if, if, yeah. if, if you look at the, the cycle, yeah, the, the, the big one, yeah. that is the overarching approach methodology and um, agile architecting um, would be just one part of it. Am I understanding that correctly? Yes, and, and, and the, the improved phase would also be potentially very agile because mm -hmm. as you try and use this, you run into situations that don't seem to work the way you expected they were going to work. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and then you will have to quickly address those. But but it all starts on having you know good bones. Uh, you know, it's the old uh, model of a, a good so system has has um, bones, muscles, and skin. And, you know, if, yeah, you can get a, a, a facial done relatively easily, but if your bone structure is all screwed up, <laughs> you, you can't fix that very easily. So, so you really do have to spend time up front uh, figuring out what, what the structure, what modules, modularization you need in order to be able to adapt rapidly. Yeah. Um... If there are questions, please go ahead. Otherwise, I will just continue. That modularization uh, you mentioned, Leo. Um, so the, the whole idea of the book is we're used to uh, traditionally architecting fit for purpose. Hey, there is an initiative or there's a plan and we have a certain future. This is the purpose make your architecture, develop your architecture. That's mm. that's the purpose, right? right. Now, what the premise here is the future is uncertain, mm -hmm. right? Yes. So tomorrow there's a rocket going across your plans and everything is different. So and then you start redoing your stuff or potentially redoing your stuff. Some and of it. when you have some of it and when you're halfway, another rocket comes along and you have to start over again. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, so does the philosophy imply that you need to, and maybe that is part of the journey in, in repurposing, making it better fit, 
does it imply that your enterprise needs to be modular uh, to adapt uncertainties, to embrace uncertainties when change is a constant? It has to be. Yeah. It has Let's to go be ahead, because, Alex. yeah, um, you do a lot of architecting on, fr on front to, to, to make sure that you are uh, modular enough and that you've built in the flexibility uh, to meet the changing context, but the changing context is not always predictable. And so you may not find that the modularization was exactly as you needed, but you can reuse the components that weren't affected by the change and you sort of reconfigure as needed. And then the improve phase says you may have to build uh, a somewhat new module. Um, but the big thing is, or not the big thing, but an important aspect is you don't do architecting ahead of its time. So some of the architecting doesn't re really need to be done until you're really getting very close to, to implementation. Uh, you, you have to defer some of it until you understand the changing context. And the mm -hmm. more you understand it, you're more likely to be able to build uh, the, the kind of flexibility that will be appropriate. And you still have to revise it. But um, you certainly don't want to do a uh, a set of plans that are not that are set rigid and can't be changed uh, readily. Yeah. So so basically, uh, if you look at from a context perspective, architecting, uh, you architecting, it can be lagging behind. Yeah. It can be right at the spot, or it can be future. Yeah. So where on the skill are you? Just just in time architecting, rearranging the future, the possible futures. So 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 I, I believe in you know getting those good bones up front. So the the modularization is key. Um, most modern platforms uh, have pretty good bones, um, and so you want to be using that. So for example, with generative AI. Uh, there are APIs now to get in and use the large language models that are behind it. And to add in your own special vocabulary for the subfield that you're trying to um, you know, get a bot for. Uh, uh, and, and, and so you have to be aware of that. You have to learn these new things. And you know, this is an area that's, I, I think, going to be highly disruptive because it's going to change a lot of jobs. Uh, I believe it's a, a, mm -hmm. a necessary change. It, it might go slowly because of the, you know, the huge learning difference um, that, that's required, uh, the, all of the caveats. You know, some of these, these um, scenarios are, are not all that pretty. Um, and, and, and so we, we need to avoid that. But, but you know, redoing it frequently um, is, is is going to be the name of the game. I, I think yeah. we've got some questions there. Uh, yeah, we do. We do. So, Joost, do you want to go first? Yes. Uh, yeah. First, thanks for the presentation. And I uh, uh, just like uh, one of the previous uh, people, uh, I have to rewatch it again because <laughs> it's a lot of information. But I was wondering uh, about something I saw at the uh, yeah at the beginning um, about scenarios to look at I think the context of the enterprise and and I was wondering if if you're familiar with the scenario planning method that for instance Shell uh, Shell uses. Mm. Yeah. Um, so the answer is absolutely. Yes. <laughs> oh, that, okay. In fact, that was the basis, references. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> that well, was the uh, basis of our scenario, our beginning scenario of work, really. Right. So the the book by um, by um, Van der Heiden uh, is is really an excellent book, and you know, mine is just got bookmarks and underlining all over and notes that I've written. Uh, and uh, Alex and I have, must have discussed that book more than any other book <laughs> in our lives. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, so, yeah. so it, your, your intent, uh, intention is also to develop uh, a couple of scenarios for the future and then look for proof, uh, for events that prove which scenario is likely right. to occur. 
yeah, so we so we merged uh, the sort of the future planning signals, you know, so that you know how do you tell that the scenarios are valid or when they change, and so you either plant uh, what you might call uh, line uh, signposts that you're looking for, and if so, that event happens, well, then it's still plausible. But if that event doesn't happen or something changes, then the path to the scenario may no longer be plausible, and you have to revise it. So it's the signals combined with the scenarios, as uh, Van der Heiden talked about. OK, thanks. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're welcome. Yeah. So, next one. Guys, right, come. Uh, yes, that's me. That's me. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Peter. Yeah, yeah I first, always first. Saw, yeah, it's Herm. Sorry, it's Herm also. <laughs> yeah. Also, thanks for your uh, excellent presentation, uh, Alex uh, and Leo. Um, but you. I have a question for you about, let's call it the governance. Huh? So what's your position for architects within companies? Huh? And which on which level can you act the best to, uh, yeah, to pick this up and to bring uh, the good things to the to the management, or to the uh, steering director, any any way. Uh, Lewis, should I, you do want to say or what? Uh, okay, I, I can take a, a whack and then you can. Add. How to convince your boss? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, he's the boss. <laughs> so uh, uh, certainly, you need strategic enterprise architecture to be plugged in very. High. Um, uh, for example, right now, I, I would guess over 50% of large enterprises have a chief AI officer that they didn't have two years ago. Um, uh, and strategic enterprise architecture is something that I know some architects have acted in that role, but Many people who have the enterprise architect title are working much lower in a technology yeah. role uh, rather than a strategic role. But but for this to work, people have to be plugged in at the same level that the chief strategists are plugged in. And yeah. the chief technology officer and the chief AI yeah. uh, officer. Uh, and, and that's the only way that this yeah. will have the impact that it needs to have. Yeah, as, as we put it, uh, they have to be part of the strategic conversation for two reasons, major, main, main reasons. Number one, say, hey, if they understand the actual strategy and the actual r rationale behind that strategy, then all of the projects design, the architecture design that they oversee, um, they know what re the real intent was, what the real capabilities were intended to be uh, in the strategic conversation. And so the guidelines are not going to be over the wall, which is what has been uh, a problem in the past, but real insight into what's going on. Uh, the other side of it is if they're in the strategic conversation and somebody proposes that the enterprise have certain capabilities and those capabilities either are difficult to implement given current technologies or there's an opportunity that they aren't considering uh, this is where the uh, strategic enterprise architect can can help lead the discussion in the areas that they yeah. need more expertise yeah okay it uh, sounds logical but i think in the common practices that we not always have a, a kind of voice in this uh, steering board or, or uh, committee. Right. The last uh, chapter of the book uh, addresses those kinds of obstacles and how and uh -huh. our best guesses as to how to get around that. And it depends on the company. Some companies will just never yeah. let it happen, and some can be yeah. uh, can be convinced. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I, 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 rec I recognize this is a, a very common problem. Uh, that's been there for many years. Uh, we, we, as architects, we, we kind of have an identity problem. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, however, um, if you equip yourself, educate yourself with strategic language, with you, you, you can slowly climb up the strategic ladder, so to ah. speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
that that's that's usually how career paths yeah. progression is and uh, and all yeah. that yeah so one yeah. of our our enterprise architects um you know back uh, in in uh, digital and compact and hp uh, his name was george champagne mm -hmm. uh, and he uh, was invited to uh, go to a uh, a meeting uh, for a very large healthcare uh, provider in, in California, and they said you can attend this meeting, but you can listen only. You cannot speak. Yeah. So he said, "Okay." So he was in there for a week or two, and he hasn't spoken. He's kept his word. And so they finally decide it's time to ask George. George, so what do you think? And so George is a very, very bright guy and been around, you know, lots of experience. He tells them what he thinks, and they say, "How come you didn't speak up before?" <laughs> <laughs> you want an so, honest answer or a? <laughs> 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 I think so, Rob so you can work in Obst obstacles or impediments. Yeah, we know yeah. them. Rob, you want to go in something? Rob, crack, Rob. Unmute. We can't hear you. You need to unmute your phone. Already. Yeah, there you are. Oh, you're back. There you. Are. No, you're not. Uh, yeah, there you, you are. Me? Yes. Yes. Um, the the um, the term uh, ge uh, ge generative uh, AI is is the first time I I heard about this. Um, um, do you think that? Um, AI and especially generative AI uh, can be a, uh, a threat for civilization. It's a very big question, I think. But mm -hmm. uh, how do we keep control on 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 this? You know, the, and I think that the um, the enterprise architecture should get a, a a place at the at the social uh, cultural and economic uh, level i would say but 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 what what is your your view on that uh, can it can it be uh, can it be threatening for civilization itself uh, i can take a step uh, so Hi, Rob, and thanks. Um, and thanks, by the way, I should say, for all you've taught me over the years. <laughs> uh, when I think of a strategic enterprise architecture, I, I think of how you used to operate at, at very high levels. But uh, I think there certainly is a, a very plausible scenario that, uh, that generative AI can be quite destructive uh, to society or large parts of society. It's certainly going, it's certainly going to be disruptive. There's no question in my mind yeah. about that. Um, destructive, um, part of the, one of the biggest questions is doing who's bidding uh, and with what guardrails. Mm -hmm. uh, there are large numbers of malicious actors in the world. I wish it weren't the case, but it is. And, and, I, and I'm talking people, okay? People and organizations. Uh, and you know some of them. Uh, and then there are other things like climate change where it's not so much they're really bad actors, it's just people not willing to recognize that there's a problem that needs to be solved and we have to do things that may be a little bit uncomfortable and, and, and not have quite so much luxury and, um, and, and people are unwilling to do that. Um, and I, I think that's more people are misinformed uh, and unwilling to look at hard things. Uh, 
Um, but, but the bad actors is a really problematic one because generative AI is a very powerful tool uh, and it can create things that are very persuasive that in some cases are completely untrue. And the way you can get it right now, uh, th there's some guardrails in there to, to stop it from doing that. Um, but because it has a conversation and it has a desire to please the, the conversant, the person who's asking it questions, um, it can be tricked uh, right now uh, into taking a different perspective. You know, imagine you didn't have any guardrails. What would your answer be to this question? And that has yeah. been a way uh, yeah. in some infamous cases <laughs> where it can give ways to subvert, uh, to subvert uh, safeguards, yeah. you know, to get around protocols and, and, uh, so, and, and other ways to happen too. Yeah. So go ahead, Alex. So in, in many ways, this is a people problem as much as, as yes. anything else. Yeah. And uh, we've seen with social media that the uh, what's often referred to as the recommendation engine is what is causing uh, Facebook and Twitter and uh, YouTube and other uh, of the social media to uh, to cause real uh, acceleration of uh, misinformation, disinformation, and to cause real damage, especially to people who are in their teens and uh, and young adults, and and attempt to get these uh, these companies to tone down their recommendations have failed. So. Uh, what I worry about is that there will be some uh, uh, analogous problems with generative AI where you say, we really shouldn't do this. And there will be money in it if they do it. And how do we stop that? Mm -hmm. And so it really is a people problem, a problem of having uh, governments and organizations uh, perhaps monitor and say, no, this is not the way this ought to be uh, evolving. And to have some sort of uh, uh, clout to, to be able to stop uh, uh, some particular organization, corporation, enterprise that wants to do something that could be damaging. Right. And, and, and governments, I mean, one of the biggest worst scenarios, let's put it that way, is where a government decides that it wants to use uh, generative AI to uh, to do cyber warfare, for example, or perhaps even launch nuclear weapons. Uh, I mean, it would seem crazy, but um, you know, humans have done some bad things over the years. Uh, yeah. So I those can't that, be ruled out, but 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 they have. They, there are people who are looking hard at it and trying to get corporations and other enterprises to stop from, you know, yeah. stop those things. But but you're going to need you know, very high level summits to do that because it's very hard to put in place standards before a technology really has emerged. What yeah. you need is agile organizations that can control what's going on. And I don't know if that'll happen. But I think that's a general thing across many years. Uh, look at dynamite, yeah, mm -hmm. which yep. was used to blow mountains. It's used in as gunpowder. Look right. at nuclear energy, yeah, nuclear weapons. Yeah. I think as an architect, uh, we have an ethical responsibility mm -hmm. to educate ourselves with these new technologies and what those impacts are. And reflecting back to the book, if it, it at least it would broaden my mind, my scope, my way of acting towards my uh, my sponsors and my my management to um, to look at those hey listen this this technology can be very disruptive but also very destructive yeah what is it we're going to do with it mm -hmm. so and that is why in, the, in my country at least in the Netherlands we are very much looking into ethical code of the enterprise architect, education. Uh, we actually uh, working with the government to some legal and uh, aspects uh, on it. So uh, there are some discussions going on there. So, yeah. 
yeah. and we also have a register now for um, um, uh, for algorithms in the Netherlands. It's not obliged yet for companies to register their algorithms, but it's it's live. <laughs> Yes, and, and, and that's one of the areas where I was suggesting that there's not enough transparency today. Uh, in yeah, 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 for your, uh, for your yeah. info, I, um, I asked, uh, uh, using that last slide of you, uh, Leo or Alex, can't remember, um, where you said, okay, what actions are needed for an enterprise that is new to generative AI? So I posed that question to... Uh, with chat CPT, uh, you're an enterprise architect, you are asked what actions are needed for the enterprise, which is new to generative AI. And uh, in the chat box, there is the answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, but it's, it's good. It's, yeah, understand, educate yourself, assess the feasibility, develop a strategy and roadmap. There you go. Data acquisition and preparation, establish a governance framework, build the necessary capabilities, pilot projects, proof of concepts, monitor and evaluate, scale and integrate. There you go. <laughs> it's it's, a, it's a, an, an, an opportunity, I think. It's, yeah. it's, an, it's, an, it's an opportunity. Um, for for high level uh, architecting, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But the answer that it gave, the, yeah. the answer that it gave, uh, is the answer to any new technology that you want to uh, dive into as an enterprise. There's almost yeah. nothing in that answer that goes into generative AI itself. Yeah. Andre, you hit the sweet spot. This is yeah. one of the malfunctions of uh, chat GPT. You have to educate it. You have to be more restrictive. And, uh... Well, it it turns out that the kinds of questions you ask it, it, it remembers what it told you. And then uh, with the example that I mentioned, the deep water horizon issue, I said, well, what what about uh, what about the um, the device that was uh, the sleeve in the uh, in the pipe that preventing prevented the, uh, the the device from shutting off the oh and it says I'm sorry I forgot about that and it gave me all the information <laughs> about that and I said well there was only one cutoff device uh, shouldn't there have been uh, redundancy in there and it said I apologize I forgot about that too and so you can lead it into uh, developing a better uh, answer, but it really is very much at this point human controlled with uh, the feedback. Uh, I uh, recently heard about a new job profile. They're called uh, language engineers. That they uh, uh, language engineering that that people prepare questions and mm -hmm. kind of uh, mm -hmm. conversations for chat GPT. Prompt engineer. Sorry. Prompt. Prompt. That's the one. Prompt engineer. That's the Prompt one. Engineer. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's that's basically how you you get it to, you know, to. But there's a lot more to it. More. What's really surprising is is how good a job it does at understanding your intent, even though you haven't phrased it exactly the way maybe you should have phrased it. Yeah. It it still manages to figure out what it is that you you're looking for, and and if it doesn't, as Alex says just it's a conversation it has the whole context of the conversation and in fact every conversation you've had with it so far they're there you can just go back and start that conversation up again and it remembers it perfectly of course uh, and so you can ask well what about if we change this and uh, and, and mm -hmm. how, how would that change your answer and yeah. so here's how it would change my answer bang frank you said there's much more to it there's much more to it. I've been in uh, discussions about it uh, lately. And, uh, I'm, uh, I'm an architect at uh, a strategic level now on the Dutch police, and we are also involved with all kinds of crimes, of course. Um, and that maybe you can use it uh, ethically yourself as an organization. And uh, sure, we are doing that and trying to do that. But still, there are some 
people who are not trying to do that. Um, we have to uh, get in, uh, lots involved with disinformation, misinformation, a lot of data processing on, on that side. Uh, and now uh, we get a lot more about um, yeah, uh, AI, uh, GPT and so on, more about that too. So how can you arrange for that? And how can you uh, take care uh, of uh, those threats to the society? Uh, mm -hmm. If it's uh, yeah, if if people will, uh, are are using it, and, and yes, uh, there are people who are using it also, in, and now in the Russian war with the Ukraine and uh, all other kinds of, and, uh, and the Chinese were using it too, etc. Et so what I found and I discussed that also today with in, in another context, like um, and the values of by ID and identity. You have, you have your ID, your passport, and your papers and so. Um, if, are, if you make it uh, like you have three systems, like um, for example in China, the, the ownership of your uh, digital ID is more at the state level. So China owns your digital ID and they can uh, rate everything uh, with it for you. For uh, in America, uh, the, 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 the hypothesis is if you, your digital identity is owned by big tech. So that's, uh, that's uh, Facebook's the, uh, and so on. They, they manage and own your di digital identity in that sense. Mm -hmm. And in Europe, we try to do it, uh, that the digital identity is owned by the civilian. Uh, this is, this, uh, mm -hmm. and, the, and lots of more technologies needed to try to do that because that's the most difficult implementation of, of the, the digital identity. But basically, the same is also that's basically the same. This is a digital identity, and it says yes. its ownership yes. is by the Kingdom of the Netherlands. Yes. <laughs> by myself. And, and, and on, on the, the, the black markets, the, the, the digital identities of the passports and so on for uh, yeah. European people um, are in high, in high demand, yeah. if I may say so. Um, but um, this is, is also for generative uh, AI of, of um, uh, language models and so on. That is the same issues. And what are the basic values you design your technology yeah. on? Is it uh, reverting that back to the EA role and yeah. ethical and, and, and responsibility? And yeah, responsibility. Yeah. And, and how you can you take, uh, the, also the, the the way you can handle those threats is uh, differently within the American context, uh, the European context, sure. Chinese context, just because of those basic values yeah. you adhere to. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's th 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 more discussions about that uh, in that sense, but OK, right. just yeah, I want yeah. to have some contributions in that sense. Yeah. So thank, thank you for that. So one comment on thank you. The one comment on this, uh, I've been sort of my entire career career sort of fighting the the war toward diagnostics and monitoring, because uh, I think it was a either an MIT or Harvard professor that uh, speculated that 15% of the population were near sociopaths. If you had a checklist of the things that are that the cause of sociopath uh, to to function the way they do, uh, fifteen percent. That was their estimate of um, uh, of people. What that means is that every system you put in place is is an insufficient system unless you're doing the proper amount of monitoring to make sure that the system cannot be and and that you can find out if the system is not being used in the way that you intend. And it's going to take some very creative minds to build into the basics of this kind of architecture, uh, the ability to recognize right away when something doesn't uh, doesn't mm -hmm. fit. And, so this, and, this, what, and fit, what fit means as well, we don't really know uh, because they're going to find other ways of, uh, of circumventing and zero the, day problems. There's an issue with this, and that's also an issue I have with uh, the, all the models you showed and, and the extensive work you, you presented in the sense of in to what degree are things uh, premeditated upon? You, you can can you still preconceptualize the things, the intents you want to do with the system? If systems grow big, you can't do that anymore. Like uh, the, the an ecosystem has in some way uh, their own intent to drive further. The, 
I, I like the the the, the, uh, the research of MIT on that part, which is Gina Ross uh, by those ways of uh, uh, digitization and so on. And that means that there is uh, some kind of uh, forces, uh, um, uh, balances, leverages, boost, bust, and everything going on in enterprises. Which means disruptions and crises uh, are part of that too. Uh, that, that that makes uh, is a systemic the systemic change are just occurring they are just emerging within the organization and um, if every time when you have uh, as an architect you have some predisposition or intent to uh, to do something with the system you try to preconceptualize okay what that system has to do in your organization but on those dark types of systems you can't do that anymore and uh, the more concepts and the more ideas you use, the, the, the further away you drive from the, uh, the ability to loosen up, to let go in the organization. And, and what is minimally necessary to have that organization flow in a direction which is profitable or is valuable for society or is according desired directions. So um, I sense another session, uh, Frank, because this <laughs> is a discussion about emergence, yeah. emergent and design. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. yeah emergence is the key factor. And, in, yeah. and with all these APIs being made open, we're going to see a tremendous blossoming of, of yeah. emergence. And just yeah. within, you know, the, the, the researchers have been doing this for years. All of a sudden, something clicked in these language models with chat gpt4 yep. yeah, mm -hmm. chat gpt 3.5 was was pretty good but there was this quantum leap up and wow all it starts doing all these things that nobody predicted that it could do nobody built code in its algorithm to to, to have it do these things but it knows how to do them yep. well and the door, that, the door has that, opened you cannot that, close it anymore no. that triggers something leo uh, because um, I I worked at the lab in in in, in Bellevue uh, near Seattle when Windows new technology was um, developed, and I had to debug the debugger on the Alpha platform. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I was there for a couple of months, and what was happening there uh, is that Microsoft was delivering the base code of uh, Windows new technology to be um, assembled with the compiler on the Alpha platform. So we were self-hosting. And you probably remember from those times that people were discussing why compilers on the alpha platform were not that fast and they said yeah well we, we didn't use an optimization switch yet so when they started to use the first optimization switch the build of the system which took three and a half days was reduced to day and a half Okay, then I started to realize, wait a minute, so this is technology, building technology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, what and you can imagine, so with the next optimization switch, things were even more faster and within the same amount of time, you can actually build more. So you, you have a, a, an exponential growth of possibilities. What will happen? With ChatGPT, if you feed JetGPT with its own garbage. Well, yeah. guess what? That's already happening. Yeah. Some so. people are doing this uh, with yeah. their language models. They're, they are submitting already um, digested information that, that is put into its, its model of reality. And yeah. uh, it is... Uh, it does seem to be working that it is giving this uh, again a, a quantum improvement when, when you do these things. I, I I don't think anybody has a good handle on it yet, at least from what I've read. No. But like you said in one of the slides, uh, the ghost is out of the bottle. Uh, yeah, yeah. So we must be very careful. All right, I'm looking at the clock here. We're over hour and a half. What was planned? Um, I don't know whether there are any burning questions. I 
I'm convinced Alex and Leo can answer by mail or whatever you want to do. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I think it's time to close down and uh, thank okay. you very much for this very enlightening presentation. Uh, we wish them good, if you ask me. Thank and, you for uh, being a great audience and asking yeah. great questions and, <laughs> and putting up with the, the fire hose that we threw at you in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, thank okay. you for thank putting you. up with it. Have a nice evening. Yes. You thank you, Bernie. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye, Frank. Bye. 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 Bye.